You have entered the command zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. Hey, Mr. DJ, put a cube draft on. I want to draft all night long. Bow, 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 bow. <laughs> and when the cube draft starts, I never want to stop. It's going to drive me crazy. Bow, 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 bow. Nice. That was amazing. <laughs> we had DJ beatboxing? Yeah. yeah I couldn't get him skill, to sing a single time. Out. He did six months with me. He didn't sing once. Not once. <laughs> we, we were happy, too. <laughs> that was pretty good. I'm proud of us. What's up, everybody? You're watching slash listening to the Command Zone Podcast. I'm your host, Jimmy Wong. How is it? It's Josh Lee Kwai and... And I'm DJ. Yay! All three of us are here. A lot of people have asked for this. It's only happened, like, twice. Maybe even once. It very the very first, first when you were a guest. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, we are going to be talking about Cube and building a Commander Cube. The latest Game Nights with Brandon Sanderson came out and was a big hit. A lot of people very excited. Huge hit. Yeah, we've had so many comments about people that want to build a Commander Cube, wanted more information about Commander Cube. So we've got DJ here as our resident Cube expert because, uh, spoiler alert, Jimmy and I have played a lot of Cube, but we haven't built a lot of cubes no a lot of cubes plural <laughs> haven't built not, any like cubes. single cube yeah <laughs> we are very two-dimensional up in this house uh there, we're gonna be talking about a lot of cards today right guys because a cube has a lot of cards in it if you want to build one so the best place to go do that is by supporting us by using our affiliate link at cardkingdom.com slash command zone you can go there and build an entire cube by just clicking through putting all the cards together and whammo bammo it'll arrive in your house you can get some sleeves to go with it and you're just done you're good to go in fact, Card Kingdom actually has a starter cube what? that's specifically already built to get you started with cube drafting. It's actually, it's like $99. It's cool. 360 cards, I believe. Yeah, 360 cards, sleeved. Sleeved. That's a big thing, actually. That's huge. <laughs> and it's already built for you, so they've already worked out a lot of the kinks, and that's a good starting point. Like I said, like I said it's called a starter cube. So cardkingdom.com slash command zone. That's a good way to just sort of already be like halfway in the deep end of the pool rather than having to swim all the way there. Did that analogy make any sense? It made total sense, but <laughs> okay. you never want your cards near water. Oh, yeah. so well, they're sleeved already. Not. Oh, that's right. Because... <laughs> well, actually, you probably want to double sleeve them and you probably want to put them into <laughs> yes. Ultra Yay. Pro sleeves. Eclipse sleeves are probably the ones that are going to keep them the safest. Cubes can get pretty expensive with the cards that you put in them. I played yours, DJ. It's got legit cards in it, so you really want to protect that stuff. You want to put it in legit sleeves like mm -hmm. Eclipse. You want to put it into nice uh, well it doesn't fit in a deck box but uh ultra pro actually has like a cube Boxes, box yeah. that will fit an entire cube play it on play mats all the rest of it so by supporting our sponsors you really are supporting us and the last way to support the show is directly at patreon.com slash command zone our patrons got to see the commander cube episode a day early amongst Jeez. many many other benefits we also shout one lucky patron out every single week so this week's episode is dedicated, dedicated to, to Corey thomas, thomas. Corey, you rock all right, before we kick things off, we got something special a little bit today. You might have noticed that a box suddenly appeared in front of me. <laughs> yeah, actually, if you've been paying attention on social media, you'll have seen Wizards posting cryptically about something exciting happening over the last few days, and they've actually asked us to be a part of the, pre the preview of what this new product is. Yeah, so this box here, it's called Secret Layer, and Wizards gave us a little tagline, which is, what would magic cards look like if the imaginations of the artists were completely unleashed? Mm. DJ, you like alternate arts and foils and stuff, right? Oh my gosh, I love them so much. Can, can we open it? Uh, do you know what's inside? Yeah, hang on, hang on. Before we do, we got to go over some details. Okay. Right. So okay. they're calling this a drop series, and this is one out of seven different drops. And if you guys are paying attention, you'll see that other creators are out there previewing the other ones. We're going to be one of the last people. So make sure you're on the uh, make sure you're on the lookout for that. Yeah. So each of these drops is a small collection of cards with quote wild and unique brand new art. Our drop is called Kaleidoscope Killers. DJ, what do you think Kaleidoscope Killers could possibly mean? <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, I, I think it's going to have to be multicolored. You're right. Uh, Kaleidoscope, lots of yeah. colors. Yeah, <laughs> and when I think of Lair, I kind of think of like a demon or a dragon or something like that. So, oh, okay. so maybe a multicolored dragon is my guess. Turns out... DJ is a really good guesser. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. Well, let's let you do the honors. You can oh, open it up. Oh, yes. <laughs> All right, so inside... Oh, already... Oh my gosh, so cool. Yeah, there's actually three cards in there. Yeah, go open Can I start up. talking about yeah, them yeah. right yeah, now? Yeah, 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 they're sweet. I got an idea, actually. Let's let's each grab one. All right, we'll and then we'll our play notes. them onto the table game night I... style. Yeah, you, yeah, you, you take one. your favorite. Okay, one, two, three. Pow. 
So we've got Reaper King, the Ur Dragon, and Sliver Overlord. I really should have wow. got Reaper King based on the Commander Cube episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how very fitting, right? It's all coming together. So yeah, they're all art by Justine Jones, who is a comic book artist. Or Look no, at the no, line no work on this. Yeah, really sweet. They're all in foil. Beautiful. Beautiful line work. The colors are vibrant and exciting. Yeah, they're it's pretty cool stuff, and. Um, they're all five colors, so that must be the kaleidoscope part. Indeed, and they're all killer cards, too. These are all extremely powerful cards, each in their own right. And, of course, each box is going to come with a unique code as well. So if you want to unlock sleeves on Arena and also some MTGO value, then these drops are definitely something that you want to get your hands on. Okay, I need, I need these. How do I get them? <laughs> okay, so... As we said earlier, there are seven of these. Drops, as they're calling them. Yeah, so seven different little collections of cards, and they're actually going to be selling them in a pretty unique way. So on each day from December 2nd to December 9th, one of these drops will go on sale for a 24-hour period, and then that's it. Once the 24 hours is up, that drop is gone forever. You'll never be able to order it from Wizards again. But this is great. It's not a limited edition run in the way that you might think. It's actually printed to demand. So that means if you order it within this period of time, you are going to get it. And there's a limit of 10 per drop. So not going to sell out like the Mythic Editions of the past. Okay, so on Monday, one of them comes on sale, and it's only there for Monday. It's gone on Tuesday, but on Tuesday... There's a brand new one. Right. And then on Wednesday, there's another new one. Right. But the one from Tuesday is gone. And then they'll go through that until they've sold all seven. That's right. Although astute listeners will note that there are actually eight days between December 2nd and 9th. That's because on the first day, Wizards is going to give you the opportunity to buy all seven of the drops at once in a bundle for a discount. So you don't have to wait day by day if you don't want to do that. Yes, please. I will take that off. <laughs> How much are they? Okay, so there are seven total, right? Well, five of those seven are priced at $29.99 each, and the other two are $39.99. Now, we're not in charge of previewing all of the drops, obviously, but we can say that the one we just previewed, Kaleidoscope Killers, it is one of the $39.99 ones. And if you want to find out more about this Secret Lair series, you just go to secretlair.wizards.com. They've got a bunch of other info, including which countries they're going to ship to and some other details. For instance, you can sign up and get notified when the new drop goes on sale. Yeah, we tried to give out all the relevant info here, but there's a lot. So if you're interested, be sure to check the website. Again, it'll be linked in the show notes. These look really cool. Yeah, yeah. They, they do look sweet. And they would look even better in a cube. So <laughs> make sure you check out secretlair.wizards.com if you want to find out more. All right, let's get back to the episode. Okay. So, yeah, back on the rails here. DJ, before we get started, we're going to be talking about Commander Cube, obviously, and how to build one and the best way to go about it. But why are who are you and why are you here, DJ? That's right. Okay. <laughs> uh, my name's DJ. You might notice me from the Command Zone, but you also might know me from the Jumbo Commander YouTube channel, where I talk about Commander deck techs and talk about strategy and cool decks and uh, cool guides, honestly. Uh, but the reason why you have me today is because Cube might be something I love more than Commander. Wow. Gasp. Heresy. Heresy. Know, right? It's crazy. <laughs> you know, I, you're I, not... You... Go ahead. You're not the only person to have said that, by the way. I've talked to a lot of Magic players who all agree that Cube is just one of their favorite ways to play, bar none. It's a phenomenal format, and I own several Cubes, and I've built many of them. Uh, my favorite is my Vintage Cube. That's my baby. But I also have a Cons Block Cube, which you would appreciate. Mm -hmm. ah, cool. uh, I also have, uh, I've built a Commander Cube in the past. And so I have a lot of experience uh, building up Cubes and understanding kind of what makes them tick and how to maintain them. And so so I think I'm the right person to walk you through this Commander Cube. D I yes, agree. DJ is our Cube expert today. So, okay, <laughs> main topic is building a Commander Cube, but we're going to begin and we're going to split this episode kind of in half. We'll start by explaining and talking about what a regular Cube is, and then we'll kind of transition into talking about the specifics of designing or building a Commander Cube, which has its own sort of intricacies and difficulties. Yep. But without knowing or understanding exactly how a regular cube works, I think it's even harder to just jump straight to Commander Cube, right? Absolutely. So we're going to start with regular cube. DJ, what is a cube? Well, it's a geometric figure, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> I've been wondering. I know, right? What are <laughs> <laughs> 
All right. Well, a cube is basically a draft set. Right. We get draft sets all the time. Mm-hmm. You know, when we when Wizards releases a set, they're saying, hey, these cards, they play really well together. You can draft them with your friends and have fun with them. A cube is just one of those that you've made yourself. You've selected all sorts of different cards and put them together, and hopefully they play well together. And uh, some people have decided that, well, Vintage Cube, for example, it collects the most powerful cards in Magic and puts mm-hmm. them together, and it makes a really fun format. But there's also uh, Legacy Cube, Modern Cube, Mono Blue Cubes, and Uncommon things like... Cube. Yeah, or, Popper yeah. Cubes. Yep. And Commander Cube is one variation of this larger idea of you creating your own set. You're oh. creating a limited environment. Exactly. Basically. Yeah, one thing to note is that generally Cube is singleton. But in Brandon's cube, which we'll be referencing um, because of the Game Nights episode, I guess we should have said earlier, if you haven't watched the Game Nights episode, you, pro- you might want to before watching this, or you could watch yeah. this and then that. It'll probably work in either direction. We'll try not to spoil anything, but some people did notice that there were a couple of lands that were actually two ofs in the cube, and Brandon's cube just does have a couple of lands. I believe he did that for better fixing and just more right. options for players to play more colors. Yeah, well, none, more- of, none of the spells are, right. are more than singleton, but some of the lands were doubled up. And one thing that's great about a cube is that you are building it. So if you want to break these rules and create multiples, you totally can. Mm-hmm. I've seen cubes where if you draft one squadron hawk, you draft four squadron hawks. That's just a rule within the yeah, cube. That's yeah, that's just oh, like that's kind cool. of a rule within the cube. And I've also seen other cubes where uh, people introduce multiple of certain cards. For example, my cons block cube, there are more commons in the set than uncommons or rare. Makes right. sense because you want it to simulate what cons is, not so singleton wouldn't really work. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about cube size. There are varying size of cube. The common ones are 360 cards, which is the Card Kingdom starter cube is 360. 540. Sometimes you'll see a big cube at 720. Brandon's cube was over 900 <laughs> cards, which is kind of crazy. It's a oh, huge cube. That's yeah. huge. Do you know how many, yeah. you know how many cards a, a Tony Hawk's cube has? <laughs> 1080! <laughs> Jimmy's been saving that one. I, for a while. I saw the numbers. I was like, "Wait a second. <laughs> so let's talk about the advantages, disadvantages of cube size here. Um, larger or smaller? What, what do you yeah. have to say? About so if that we start days? off with a small amount, uh, three hundred sixty cards. If you have eight people drafting, uh, three packs of fifteen cards each. It all adds up. So basically, every single card in the cube will be opened by those eight players over those three packs of 15. Mm. So every draft, you'll see every card in a 360 cube. Exactly. With eight players, yeah. So you can build in some certainty with what's going on in your cube because you know that every card will be available. Mm. But you might feel like your cube gets redundant because the same cards are being opened every single time. Right. Right. Uh, For 540, then there's going to be some cards when you sit down at a draft that'll never be opened. You'll never see them from one cube session to another. Right. And then... Approximately 180 cards. Exactly. And 720 is even more so. Mm -hmm. So it increases the variance and maybe the replayability, but I would assume that the larger it gets, the harder it is to design. The harder it is to predict what the decks are going to be like. And so you might end up with decks that gravitate towards good stuff Mm -hmm. rather than specific themes because you run into that push and pull of, Mm -hmm. well, if my cube is small, I can build very specific themes because every card will be there at the table. Mm -hmm. And if there's a card that belongs in this theme, then it'll wheel and it'll be opened and everything will be great. The larger you get, then maybe if you include a two-card combo like uh, Sahili and Felidar Guardian, maybe one of those isn't even opened. And, and the larger it gets, the more likely it is that one of them isn't opened. Exactly. Right. So it feels bad. You draft one, hoping the other comes around, and it, it just good chance it just never will. See it. Yeah. Yeah, because the goal of Cube is to create a play environment that's fun right. and enjoyable. And as the creator, you really want people to be excited and happy when they're playing with mm-hmm. your Cube. And there are a few feel bads when someone's like, like, well, I keep drafting Felidar Guardian and I never actually get the second half of the combo. What's going on? Right. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say in that case, a lot of times you'll see cubes. Like, let's say it was a Kiki Jiki and Pestermite combo. Mm-hmm. Like, blue red is still a very strong thing. But in the case that you don't find one or the other, you can still make a really good blue-red deck. So you don't get as punished, right? Are you trying to build in those sort of insurance policies? And they'll build in redundancies. So you mentioned uh, Pestermite. They'll build in Deceiver Exarch. They'll Splinter build Twin. in Splinter Twin. They'll build in um, Zealous Conscripts. And so they'll try to reach a critical mass for a strategy. I think one of the things people really liked about the Game Nights episode was that 
when we built the decks from the draft, everybody had a strategy that was pretty clear cut. Like Brandon was right. Nickel Bolas and playing Nickel Bolas, <laughs> steal, stuff. steal your stuff, kill your stuff, mind control your stuff. Jimmy was playing a tokeny strategy. I had the graveyard recursion strategy. Nadine was playing like an all haymakers and removal deck. Mm-hmm. Like his cube was huge, and yet we managed to find these nice archetypes, which I think made it feel more like commander to people. Yeah, and when we go go into the second half of the episode where we talk about his cube specifically and commander cube specifically, we're going to find out some of the ways that he was able to make such a large card size feel so unique and diverse. Right. Mm-hmm. And one more note, when you're saying opening packs, we're not actually opening cards in cube. Usually what we're doing is... Hold on. Uh, fail. That was just fail. For the listeners at home, DJ tried to do some sort of move with the paper in it. it He's known for this. This is a great move. <laughs> you try to float the paper. Oh, nice. That one actually works. That was nice. It was like a little paper airplane. <laughs> okay. Anyway, you're not opening cards. Usually what you'll do is you'll shuffle up all the cards in nice sleeves. That's why we love it. All the 900 sleeves. cards or whatever. Yeah. So you shuffle them all up and then you create piles of packs. So basically 15 card packs. And then you pass those around. And that's what we call like opening a booster pack. You're basically making your own booster pack. Oh, and something, something along those lines that you noted here, DJ, was that in a commander cube or a larger cube, maybe you try and sort of mitigate against some of those disadvantages you were talking about by having the packs be more than 15 cards. So in Brandon's cube, for example, we open 21 card packs, right. not 15 card packs, which just kind of ups the level or amount of cards you're going to see and makes it so maybe the synergies are a little bit easier to put together because you get those extra cards that you wouldn't otherwise have. The more cards you can see, the more consistent your deck can be and the more you can build exactly what you want. Mm-hmm. Uh, have you ever made a sealed deck? Right. Six yeah. packs. Yeah, yeah. Have you ever done a box sealed before? Yeah, that's more like constructed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So it ends up being so much more refined because you just see more cards and right. you can make something that feels a little bit more like constructed. And so in this commander cube, you're going to want to try to create an environment that isn't just like, let's just draft some cards, but let's create mm-hmm. something that feels like a commander deck. Right. I like rec- recommending that to newer players too sometimes. Like I've done four pack drafts of limited sets just to make sure everyone in case they waffled around and didn't like solidify what they're doing can get enough cards to make sure that their strategy actually works at the end of the day. Yeah, our player group used to do that a lot when we were learning to draft. Just that extra pack just made everybody less stressed. And, yeah. mm-hmm. and it made it a lot easier for people who aren't good at draft to feel like, okay, I'm still going to end up with a good deck at the end because I just have have like six or seven extra cards I wouldn't have had. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, so, mm-hmm. okay, um, let's talk about cube power level here. So what power level do you want games to be at is a question you need to be asking yourself when you're building your cube. So for instance, Brandon's cube on game nights, he purposely didn't use any cards in that cube that were in his powered cube, his vintage cube. So a lot of cards were just out, just wouldn't be in the cube at all. Uh, because he had made that decision. If it was in one, it wasn't going to be in the other. And this was a way, I think, for him to sort of cramp down on or put a a, um, a check on the mm-hmm. highest of high power levels that it could get. So you couldn't have Kiki-Jiki Pestermite in that cube, which I think a lot of Commander players out there who don't like that in Commander wouldn't like it in cube either. But you, you could just not have that in your cube, and then you don't have... Like, if you don't like infinite combos... Don't put them in. You, you could just yeah. not have them in your cube, and then nobody's going to infinite combo. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you don't want a single removal effect, you could do that, too. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Probably you don't <laughs> want to do if that. If you want though. only mass land destruction, <laughs> hey, it's your cube, not mine. <laughs> Yeah, the thing. So there are tons of power of different kinds of cubes. You'll hear people say this is a powered cube, this is a vintage cube, and the reason that you know I think Brand wanted to avoid putting power, so like the Moxon and stuff, and all those like very powerful cards in his cube is that if you watch a streamer draft the vintage cube, for instance, the moment a Mox comes up or a time walk, it's an instant take, and right. there's no yeah. like ifs, ands, or buts about it. And so it sometimes can sort of narrow the direction that you go. And I think his commander cube wanted to be a little more free form and practical, especially because he had his special conspiracy esque cards in there too. Right. Well, also, you want to make sure that your cube is pretty balanced. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy in a vintage cube to say, well, okay, only the best cards, the most competitive cards can be balanced. But when you're talking about uh, a cube with the power level that Brandon has, or maybe even a modern cube, you can include some cards in there that will skew the format and make one strategy way more powerful than the other. And then you're creating a play environment that isn't as fun. When right, everyone because knows. whoever opens yeah. this card and drafts that archetype is just going to have an advantage. That's not super fun necessarily. People know yeah. that Mono Red wins way more often than the other archetypes. Then people might go after Mono Red and then you're not getting those interesting games. And then maybe two people decide to go Mono Red because they know it's a powerful archetype. And then you split that and then it ends up creating not very fun play environments. Uh-huh. You also had a note here about just the practicality of like 
a cube that doesn't have all your most powerful stuff in it. Yeah. So when you, here's the thing, you want to play with your cube. Right. So if you make a cube, you kind of want to keep it together and, and have it's a it lot there. of work to put it together. It too. really yeah. is. Oh, yeah. You and don't so, want to be stripping cards out of it. Yeah. Time. And so if you have every single one of your commander staples, all of your most precious cards together in this cube, and you're only playing it once a month or once every deck, three months. Right? They're not they're not in your commander decks. Right. And so some people, when they're putting their best and most favorite cards together, they're not getting enough use out of them. And we want you playing with your cards. Right. Uh, and also, if you have every card from Vintage Cube in there, that's a lot of money. That's a yeah. lot of money. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So so bulk rares and commons and uncommons can really be a great backbone for your cube because you're not going to use those cards otherwise. And people yeah. think like, oh, that's not going to be as fun. It is so much fun. Tons of fun. Popper yeah. Cube is very fun, very interactive. It's a really great game. And same thing with those bulk rares. A lot of times the cards that we like to play with in limited are those like the, those uncommons that are like interesting mythic to play. Mythic uncommons. Yeah, those mythic not good uncommons. Enough to play yeah. In like your yeah, yeah, they're not really good enough. And so you can set your power level to make sure that your cards are super interesting, but not super, you know, expensive and something that'll really break your budget. Yeah. Yeah. Breathe some life into those old bulk commons and uncommons that you still might have lying around. Or well, like, people really love like when Feather comes out, like getting to play all these cards that, you know, they just couldn't put anywhere else or in any other deck. They were just useless to them. And cube yeah. could be a way to make cards relevant and fun to play that you just couldn't put into your commander decks. Well, and also some people that might have been buying pre-cons for a few times, they might have excess of these commander staples that right. could go together into a commander cube very nicely. All right, let's talk about archetypes and themes. So once you've decided like how big your cube's gonna be, what your power level you want it to be at, you need to start figuring out you know, what specific cards go in there, what tools you wanna give to the drafters, what archetypes and themes are supported. Mm -hmm. um, what are some good advice for people that are starting to design their cube? I've started this process like a couple of times and you think it's gonna be like deck brewing and then you're like, oh no, it's exponentially harder than deck brewing. It's like- You're like making 10 to 12 different decks. You're a game time. designer. It it's really, really makes difficult. you uh, yeah. appreciate the people at Wizards and how hard their job is. And so you can use people that have already done the work uh, for you as a jumping off point. Uh, some people have started off with like a set like Modern Horizons and use that as a jumping off point for saying, well, I need this kind of card draw spells and I'll replace this with mm. the kill spell and stuff like that. But uh, I still have maybe Snow Covered as a theme and I still have Plus One Plus One Counters maybe as a theme and Artifacts as a theme. And one of the great things is that you kind of might have a lot of those cards lying around if you opened up that set a lot. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, you can also go and take a cube from someone offline you can take my cubes offline and brandon's, start we've got his whole list brandon's yep. list offline too and start messing with it a little bit and really making it your own and part of cube is also really play testing it as you go along and figuring out what works and what doesn't work one thing i like to do is at the end of the night i ask everyone what their first pick was what card they're excited oh, about nice. what their last pick was and so you know, like the last pick cards maybe need to get out of the cube, mm -hmm. and the first pick cards maybe I need more support for that because mm -hmm. I know people naturally want to do that. That or makes this total one's sense. too powerful. We can't keep it in there. That happens all the time. People say like this is busted, right? And that's happened a few times when something has been kind of busted and unfun in my vintage cube, and I've been like, "Oh, you gotta, I gotta pull it out to keep the balance." Uh, the way we want it because we want everyone to have a really fun play experience. Now for your cubes, did you sit down and write down, I want this archetype, this archetype, this archetype? Did you look through your cards and find the ones that spoke to you? What sort of brought you to like finalizing what your cube was going to look like? So that's a really great question because for each different cube, it was a different process. Mm -hmm. For my vintage cube, I took the Magic Online vintage cube list and sort of tweaked that and made it my own. So again, took a cube list that it's someone else did all point. the grunt right. work for and then made it a little bit of my own. Uh, then when we talk about thing like cons block cube, I essentially worked off of the work that wizards already did in creating mm. that cons block experience. And I did stuff like, uh, take away a lot of the higher power level cards. Do you remember later on in comms block and fate reforged when they had things yeah. like Citadel siege and yep. suddenly it wasn't fun anymore. You just get that. You just win every <laughs> yeah. day. Yeah. So instead just I took it out. Uh, you know what I mean? So we, we identified what made the format not fun and I took those out. 
Yeah, right? and you also took out the rares, for example, that weren't made for limited, but had to be rare or mythic in that rare. Okay, yeah. I see, I see. This makes a lot more sense. And then with the Commander Cube, that one I tried to build from scratch a little bit more. And, and we're going to talk about this. You had a hard time with the Commander Cube, right? Yeah, I did have a hard yeah. time putting together the Commander Cube. And one thing I did lean on, though, is I leaned on the 2016 precons, ah, the okay. four, four color, color precons, to kind of give me some direction about what archetypes I want and really use them as a larger card pool. Great. That experience is going to be really useful when we move into the Commander Cube section here. But we're going to finish out with just a couple pieces of pieces of advice. I think obviously we're not going to be able to tell you how to design a cube on this show. <laughs> you could probably do an entire podcast that's just about you cube. Could do I'm that. surprised yeah. nobody's maybe somebody's doing that. And I apologize if you are, but to my knowledge, there isn't one. And hey, if you know a lot about cube, there you go. That idea is go. free. Okay. There's also uh, plenty of articles. People have yeah, written a lot about fun. this online. Yeah, a lot of cube designers out there. One of the big things I would say about designing a limited environment is to make sure you have a good amount of cards whatever your archetypes are that straddle multiple archetypes so if you got a plus one plus one counters theme and a graveyard recursion theme find as many cards as you can that play in both of those themes that even, are pivot points for those strategies right, right. even something like den protector yeah where you yeah, might plus think plus you might think oh eternal witness is just better i'll stick that in there but den protector megamorphs and gets us plus one plus one counter right. so now it's also recursion back from and it's your one one counter it goes in either deck and, all and is a good stuff card as well right, yeah right um and that's really important in a lot of cubes we get super excited for cards that might seem unimpressive but straddle different strategies so uh for example i got very excited when Charter Course came out. Mm -hmm. It's just a blue draw two. If you didn't attack, you discard one. Right. And you think it's a very mediocre card. But I was super excited because it could go in blue and give you that card advantage, that velocity, but also be a discard outlet for the reanimator deck. Right. Very cool. Or if you had Dredge or something, for instance, or cards you wanted in your graveyard, then yeah, it's great for that. Yeah. All right, let's talk about color balance in the cube. I think this is kind of one of the last things to think about when you're designing it. You want to make sure that you have... I think most cubes have like the same number of cards in each color. Mm -hmm. What you don't want to do generally, there's there's exceptions Always exceptions, to all rules. Because yeah. uh, in Vintage Cube, blue is super, super strong and everybody knows it. So they kind of weigh, they kind of lean into it. My Vintage Cube and the online, I think all of them do, and the yeah. online Vintage Cube has more blue cards than other cards. Mm -hmm. Just because blue is stronger and will get drafted more and everybody knows that. But yeah. in general, when you sit down to draft a cube, if it's not vintage, your assumption is I can draft any of these colors and they'll be equal to the other colors. And so you really want to have the same amount of cards available in each color. Otherwise, you know, you're not telling people, hey, don't draft red because there's just less red cards. Yeah. You want all the archetypes to be viable. And because so many people pull out of blue, uh, it ends up making certain archetypes not viable. And so what right. they've done is they've bolstered blue a little bit. Uh, just that in might vintage. Be, yeah, yeah, just in vintage. And part of the reason might be because Storm actually yeah. mm -hmm. uh, it requires, it. requires a few of these random blue cards. And it's kind of a problematic strategy that's fun. It's also really important to make sure that your archetypes can beat each other. So, for instance, if there is a Storm deck, then there should be ways to beat it through, for instance, pure aggression in red, or maybe red has burn spells when green has a bunch of big blockers so that you can just go straight to face. Like, there are ways for the archetypes to beat each other. Otherwise, you're going to find, and I've seen this in so many cubes, red is always the most underpowered color, and then as a result, you see, like, Hellkite Tyrants and stuff going around so late, and you're like, why, Hellrider? Why are you still in this pack? Or the Storm deck can just beat itself, because it's not that great. <laughs> I, when it, I've never won with Storm in cube ever, but I always try it so because it hard. seems fun. It seems Modern not, Red yeah. is usually really good in cube, actually, yeah. but nobody drafts it because that's not the it's fun not strategy. It's not the fun thing to do. But fun, if you right. do, you will win, usually, but yeah. Um, all right, so it can be pretty daunting to put a cube together. It requires you to put your game design hat on, obviously, and it's even more challenging in multiplayer. Uh, we just went through what a cube is and sort of some of the basic rules about it. But now we're going to talk about designing a commander cube. And DJ, you have a lot of experience with this. So why don't you kick us off here? What, what was so difficult particularly about making a commander cube? Yeah, I think that one of the main things that makes Commander Cube difficult is because most of the time you're playing with, you're drafting with four people instead of eight people. Mm -hmm. And so it really has to do with how many cards people see and what kind of archetypes you're building in. And so, and so. Yeah, because when, when you're drafting yeah. with four, just less of your cube is going to be open. So any of your given archetypes just might not show up in enough 
uh, density, density mass, to actually yeah. make it happen. So you can like go down the path of like, I'm going to do plus one, plus one counters. This is going to be great. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> no more plus one, plus one counters stuff. Comes. And you can guarantee that that exists. Like you can build your cube. So it's designed for four people drafting, but then it feels flat and boring because you're just like, oh, I guess I'm the plus one, plus one counter person. And I'm just going right. to go after that strategy because uh, yeah, you're you writing the line. Multiple archetypes. Yeah. To build. It's commander. So you want to be able to build Voltron if you want to, or build Reaper King if you want to, or build Graveyard right. Recursion if you want to, and so on. Yeah. So that's a that's a pretty big challenge when designing it. Absolutely. And then those those are specific archetypes that are unique and feel like commander and feel like you're really going after a specific deck. Uh, but there's a tendency to want to go towards good stuff. Just because it's easier? It's, it is much easier. And, and everyone can draft into their deck and it'll always do the thing it needs to do, right? And sometimes in commander, we're not very satisfied with these good stuff decks that we play. Right. Mm -hmm. We kind of like, want to move that. I wrath the board. I play a big creature. Mm, but eternal kind of witness. Work together. Yeah. 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 Which is cool and can be powerful, but that's not generally what most people like about Commander. And again, I think the thing people liked about the Commander Cube episode was that it did feel like Commander. Like everybody right. had a personality at the table of what their deck was trying to do. And so that can be hard where you have good stuff, which is easier and more conducive to fewer players and then you and more conducive to a smaller cube. And then you have the archetypes. You know, where... Um, you may not get the density. To I'm sorry. Make. The good stuff is more conducive to a larger cube. Right. And the uh, archetypes okay. are more conducive to smaller a cube. smaller cube where you can guarantee the card pools that people are looking at. What a more homogenized experience overall. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, another thing I would assume is makes Commander Cube even more difficult above that is... It's Commander. Yeah. The color identity of... So when we draft a deck in Cons Block or something else or whatever, an Eldraine... As we're going along, if you just want to start, oh, I'm going to start grabbing some black cards here. I'm going to play those no uh, with my blue cards that I already took. No problem. But in Commander Cube, there's this added layer of like, well, what if I was building around like a green-blue commander? And then if I want to, I start seeing good black cards. Not only do I, like I've put those in my deck, I have to find a legendary now that works with not only the colors, but also the strategy that I'm going for. You can't just pick any like Demir. Yeah commander to just lead if it's Lazav, it's gonna be totally different than if it's i don't know name another demir commander somebody bail me out uh, uh the mill one <laughs> phoenix the mil right yeah, phoenix. Oh, the they, mill one. they both the, kind of mill so i guess well, it would sort of work but anyway you get yeah. what i'm saying out there <laughs> i totally get what you're saying and and there's a few different ways to get around that number one you can have very generic commanders available uh boring underpowered ones so if you're drafting a blue black deck you know that you have access to a boring generic blue black general just without drafting it just yeah, yeah being i wanted able to, to get clarify that because i have played in a commander cube that was like that so like what that cube i played with had i want to make sure that we're talking about the same thing is like before the draft there was basically um i believe this one had a generic or mediocre commander at basically each color pairing yeah, and you always that had was, access to that media. was available. They said at the end of the draft, you can grab one of these and just play it as your commander if you want to. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to draft it. So you never have to worry about, I got to find a legendary. Now, those legendaries were not very good, but at least they'd allow you to play the colors. I think they even have the three, ten, the 10 three color yeah. pairings too. Well, and the other, the other way that a lot of commander cubes do it, and actually most of them, is you do a commander draft yes. first. So the first thing you do is you do, before you start looking at the big cube with all those cards in it, first you say, hey, now we're going to draft our commanders first. And you basically so, have a fourth pack that you start with. It's a yeah. pack of all legendary creatures, right? Yeah. And then so you open that pack, you you pass it, you take them, and then you end up with a, a 15 legendary creatures, but, and yeah. you know you've got those to choose from as you're drafting the the rest of the cards. And some people, the way they do it is they actually will have smaller packs so you won't quite have 15 because 15 yeah, felt like you have when I too did. many. I've done ones where it's been six or even four right. or something like that. And you can play those commanders in your deck as well if it happens, like if you draft a... Yeah, they're cards in your pool. Cool, cool, yeah. cool. But again, these are all different rules. That's one of the things that's interesting about Commander Cube is that we just talked about we just have played three different commander cubes that do it in three different ways. Right. Yeah. Some of them, you draft your legendaries beforehand in Brandon Sanderson's. You had to draft them along with your deck. <clears throat> yeah. He specifically said he didn't like the, the separate -draft. track. Separate yeah. draft. Yeah. Cause he felt like as you were going, you couldn't do as much. You were kind of locked in after that first pack a little bit. And so, yeah, he wanted you to be able to find a cool legendary open it and be like, I'm doing that. Yeah. 
But that uh, seems really tough because if yeah. you have a smaller card pool, it's like, well, I have a legendary card. Like Josh was saying, you might have three different legendary cards in the same lore, in the color pairing, but they don't do the same thing. Right. It, it's a little different, for instance, like plus one, plus one counters and Obzon. There are plenty of commanders that sort of fit in that range, right? And you can kind of do similar things, but it's not the case for everything. So how do you even have enough support to make all the cards work? So support is going to be a real big key to this, to building these archetypes, because the bigger you get, the more redundancy you need to make sure that you can have that archetype be viable. Mm -hmm. And ultimately it's a balancing game. It is really difficult to make sure that you build your deck with those support systems in it. And one of the be best things that you can do is have cards that overlap to provide multiple levels of support. And you'll notice that Wizards does this in their own sets, right. where some cards will be able to sort of ride the line between two different strategies. I yeah. would say, too, that um, Cube's always going to be a little different than a com an actual commander deck, whereas in an actual commander deck, 100% of your cards can be towards a plan. If you watch the Game Nights episode... Jimmy has a token focused deck, but he also has a, 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 um, a sort of sub theme of legendary creatures and sneaking out some big things. And I had like a recursion theme, but I also had a token sub theme and like, yep. that's the way limited works. And that's why it's awesome is that MacGyver aspect of like building the machine on the fly. And so you're like, this is my primary strategy. And then trying to find like another strategy that's going to fill out the rest of it because you know you're just not going to get 23 cards that all do the same thing. You might get nine that do one thing and another six or seven that do another thing that's so slightly related and you feel clever being like these two things actually work well together. Yeah. So that's one of the things I think about designing the cube and even playing it is not thinking, oh, the Graveyard Recursion deck is going to be 100% cards that re recur from the graveyard some of that stuff is you know you're gonna need a sub theme or other things to fill it out and you can turn the dials a little bit in one direction or the other to try and balance this out because this is not a science where you get it right immediately in fact right. commander decks themselves you very rarely just make a first draft and you're like it's perfect right and so there's different ways that you can kind of mess with those numbers one way that people do it on the fly is actually allowing trading after the draft yeah this is interesting you, you wrote this down I've, I haven't seen this in a commander cube before can you explain how, the, how that's worked when you it? Yeah. So basically what it has been is uh, you've been in your pods and basically you're allowed to say uh, uh, you can trade this many cards. You can trade for this amount of time where you say uh, I've picked up these red cards who has some green cards and like you just kind of trade around a little. Right. Like I thought it was going to be red, but then I actually switched into blue. And so I don't I can't play these four red cards. Did anybody else do that for either of my other colors? And then you just trade them straight across. So, yes, it was very fun when I did it, but it also took up a ton of time. Uh, yeah. Right. Everyone's sitting <laughs> there debating. And yeah. then you're thinking, well, am I going to give you this amazing card for just this card that happens to be in my color? Right. And it becomes this deeper game when, honestly, I feel like Commander Cube should be just overwhelmingly fun rather than strategizing about trading. So trading is very cool and enjoyable, but it also has a problematic aspects. A downside. To it. Yeah. And I, I would say that, uh, you know, a, a way to fix some of this stuff would be like draft an additional pack or stuff like that, which is, are things you can do, but all those things do add time to the draft. And the draft will already take a quite a long time. I think it was like an hour for us to draft this cube with yeah. Brandon. Tons of decisions to be made. Yeah, and you have to read so many cards and stuff oh, like yeah. that. And three hours to shuffle it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we didn't know what Akhan's run did, so you got to, every person that goes by you don't has know to Akhan's read it. Akhan's run? <laughs> Okay, I don't. So, <laughs> one, okay, yeah, one, I one other thing that's really interesting is that we've heard from Commander Legends coming out about a year from now that they're not doing traditional packs of 15. Right, they're, they're doing, doing packs of 20. Packs. So they're actually, they got the same problems that a Commander Cube Brewer has. Which and, is really cool, actually. And they're tackling it in similar ways, right? Yeah, yeah. so yeah. I have a feeling that when Commander Legends comes out, we're going to be paying Cube players and Commander Cube players are going to pay extra close attention to how Wizards problem solves these same scenarios. And I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of Commander Cubes go, oh yeah, that's the way to do it. Yeah, yeah. interesting. Or and if a lot of people just build Commander Cubes out of that set. Well, it, I mean, it turns out if you hire a bunch of like professional, <laughs> the best game designers in the business to do something, you should probably copy what they're doing. Well, right. not to mention, they also have one of the best testers in the world go up to their headquarters and yep. try it out themselves. That's right. Josh went up almost a year ago to try out the Commander Cube or the Commander Draft experience that Gavin's working on. So that means they've been working on this for multiple years. They've been, they're going to have tons of playtesting done. I think a lot of people are going to be really interested in what they come up with. Yeah, I think Gavin said uh, six years he's been working on this is almost the same amount of time that Morrow was working on Unstable. So it's, wow. it's really like Gavin's... Uh, I know. Who's excited? So, yeah. I'm excited. I'm so excited. Okay, so let's talk about some of Brandon's solutions. So Brandon's cubes specifically that we played on game nights, he came in 
contact with a lot of these same problems we've been discussing. And Brandon being a very creative guy and a super smart guy, somewhat of a game designer, obviously. And if you read his books, you would definitely feel that. A world designer, right? Yeah. Yeah. We were talking about the magic systems yes. earlier and how we think that his magic systems are really cool and, and interactive and really logical and make a lot of sense. And now I can see how he's kind of applied that same logic here. I mean, I asked him point blank. I was like, clearly... Game design is something that, you know, speaks to you in some way and you do put it into your writing. Like, do you do that consciously? And he's like, oh, yeah. So, totally. yeah, because the rules of his magic systems and how they work in his world are very well designed. Like, you could say, like a lot of writers, I mean, like Tolkien and stuff, you don't really know what Gandalf can do and yeah. what the rules of it are, right? <laughs> he's just a day sex mocking Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but Brandon's worlds don't work like that. He lays it out. They can do this. They can do that. Here's the downside. Here's what they need. Here's right. what, you know. So, he's very much a game designer. So, he, of course used that part of his brain to help his commander cube, and it worked really, really well. So Brandon had a series of what he called regalia. Which are very similar to what conspiracies were, if you guys yeah. ever draft a conspiracy. So these came in different forms. Some of them were just cards that were in packs, but they were, we'll put some on screen here, and actually Brandon did give us the template for all these regalia, and they're customizable too. So if you want to design your own, you could type in your own and print them out. And uh, he bought the rights to all the clip art and everything that's used on them <laughs> just so that it'd be all be on the up and up. So what Brandon, cool dude. That's yeah, awesome. Brandon yeah. wanted people to be able to do this and design their own stuff. So one of the things he did is he, he had what were called crowns. So these were cards that were in packs. And if you took it, it would just say something simple like, your commander's color identity has blue in addition to its other colors. Which is exactly what blue I crown. did to play a Nephilim as a five color commander. Right. So you just add a crown. And if you picked up a couple of them, you or there were rules, I think. Uh, you yeah. could only have like one one regalia per commander or something like that. It's in, it's all in his rules. And I guarantee that what happened is that someone, one of his friends, was playing his cube and broke it. <laughs> and at the end, <laughs> they're, like, they're like, all right, let's sit down and let's problem solve this and let's go through it. And that's something that, that you guys should embrace too as yeah. you're building your cube to say, okay, what happened here with this deck monstrosity that, that actually right. dominated this format, you know? But uh, I think it's a really cool example of a way to sort of help it's sort of along the lines of having those generic commanders that you have access to at the end of the draft. A crown is a, solves a, a problem in a similar way. It says, oh, you want blue? Well, if you just use one pick on this blue thing, then you can add that to any of the commanders you find, and that will mean that you didn't waste those three or four picks or whatever, and you know, you're going to be just fine. Well, and also you notice the stress of having to get the exact right commander and that removes a lot of the stress and say, well, if I have this blue regalia, I can pick blue cards and be totally fine. I'll and, always get to play the blue yeah. cards. Yeah. yeah. And, and then I can eventually pitch, pick up that legendary creature. And if you turn the three color commander into a four color one, you might still only be playing three colors, right? Right. Not, it, not one of the colors of the actual commander. You yeah. just have a couple. Yeah. Good call. Um, he had what was called scepters, which were allowed you to find extra cards after deck building ended. So you could Super draft. powerful. Yeah, very powerful, but he, he only... So these scepters came in the same sleeve with only certain cards. So you couldn't just necessarily grab the scepters, as I recall. We only drafted it one time, so I could mm -hmm. be mis, uh, misinforming slightly. But anyway, the scepter would say, like, you can find pick a creature type. Go find five creatures of this creature type after the draft is over. Whoa. So it would allow, like, a vampire strategy when... If you have a 900 card cube, how many vampires would you need in it to make vampire tribal as a archetype viable mm -hmm. if you didn't have a card like that? I mean, I would pick humans and like go and yeah, get like yeah. crazy humans I, that's if, why if I, I didn't have that. That's why I think it, it only went like it went. So it was in a vampire card and you could only get vampires. Or was it, I think Reaper King had it. It was a similar one. Actually, There's some cards. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. It's just like, look, we're opening a bunch of cards. There's a good chance you're not going to see a lot of the cards in your archetype. This isn't allowing you to find the most powerful cards ever. You need to specify like the type. I can find five goblins. And that made yeah, exactly. Reaper King work. That, right, that right. card is impossible to make function in a 900 card cube without there's like something like this. Because there's like seven scarecrows ever and some it's just, yeah. yeah, Like it, there's no support. Yeah. But with this uh, little game mechanic, suddenly you're like, oh, actually there is support. For yeah, this. it opens up a lot more possibility. And actually the Reaper King, I, I think I, mis I misstated, was a tattoo. So certain... Oh, let's talk about those. Yeah, certain <laughs> commander cards or legendary cards um, would have a card that came in the sleeve with them. And this is what it was. It was a tattoo. And that one's the tattoo for Reaper King said, you may specify five artifact creatures in your deck as scarecrows. So you, you didn't even necessarily get to go find scarecrows. You got to just turn artifact. So what it told you is draft Reaper King. Now you can just pull artifact creatures and make them turn them into scarecrows, yep. but only five of them. 
And, and but artifacts are something that could easily be included in your cube. You know you're going to be able to get five of them throughout the draft. Right. Yep. It's not like Scarecrows where there's just not very many artifact creatures are going to be running around all over. And so just grabbing some of those is going to allow you to fill out that strategy. Well, mm -hmm. and that means that the artifact creatures could support the Reaper King strategy. It could support an, archety uh, an artifact archetype or a lot of other different archetypes. And so it creates that system of, well, we have one card that fits into so many different decks. Right. Yeah. right. And it also just makes a card like Reaper King play playable uh they also had tattoos that allowed you to put two creatures in the command zone sort of like partners which also it's like let's say you have a you know a semi-powerful two two color commander and another one where you compare these two together and that i think that was a really good way of giving you the flexibility to, to do more in the draft without having to feel like oh crap i'm stuck in simic the whole time yeah and and also when you're only drafting with four players you just might not see uh, very many uh cards in the a uh, color pair yeah mm. to make it really viable to build a good deck you notice in the game nights episode jimmy played five color because he took a nephilim added a color and then nadine and i both played straight up five color commanders and then brandon played a three color commander but added a color so he was four color so almost everybody was a lot of colors because it allowed us to just play a lot of the cards we saw that came by us in the draft rather than being like i can't even look at that because it's green and i don't have green yeah so yeah as a result everyone's mana base was a little sketchy yeah <laughs> but if everybody's mana base is sketchy it's fine right yeah 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 equal <laughs> power level equal power level so in addition to that, Brandon also had some stickers that went on the outside of the sleeves, and that denoted certain things. So a clover sticker designated that a card could be your commander, even if it wasn't legendary, or even if it wasn't a creature. So, Jimmy... Yeah, me again, yeah. Yeah, the Nephilim aren't legendary, but... But, you know, a lot of people have one, and some playgroups even have them as commanders. So in Brandon's Cube's case, it's like, you know what? I do want to have more four-color options at commander. Thus, every Nephilim can also be your commander, thanks to the little clover sticker. Yeah, and I think there was, like... He a couple of artifacts or some other stuff that yeah. he was like, ah, oh, that can be your commander. That'll be fun. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. Uh, and then there were star stickers and these d had two cards in the sleeve with a star on it. And they kind of worked like partner with. So if you took one, you got both. So the star would just denote like there's another card in this sleeve and it was him creating his own partners with. So if you draft Krav, they're like, by the way, Regna's in this box over there. You automatically get her. Right. Although he just put both cards in the sleeve, I believe. So yeah. they, they were right there. Some sleeves are a little packed because of all the different <laughs> things in there. But he was doing that without ones that had partner with. He was doing oh, it with cool. like other things too so that you'd be like... Just like two creatures. Like it could be like an Elvish Mystic and then a three drop, for instance. You know, like stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. I don't know exactly what he did because again, we only That's saw crazy. a smattering of cards. But it did work with the partners with as well to yeah. make them work the same way without changing the whole rules of the cube, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then another thing Brandon did, and I don't know if this was just a side effect of not using cards that were in the powered cube or on purpose, but there was just less ramp and fixing and removal in general in this cube. So it wasn't none, but just fewer. And I think because a lot of the really good stuff was taken by the powered cube, yeah. there was no cultivate Kodama's reach and that kind of stuff at all. Uh, and there wasn't a lot of like no signets were in there and that kind of stuff. Yeah, you'll notice none of us really ramped out. We waited till turn three, I think, for everyone to make their first plays in our game. It really made the games interesting because it changed the power level a lot of stuff if you're going to have to get it out either on time or naturally. Yeah. Or it also made things like, uh, Jimmy, you had Thrawn's Temporal Gateway a lot more powerful maybe because that was the only way to get certain things out. Yep. And so it's. I, I really like what it did to the game itself, which is make it sort of progress in more of a, um, what's the word, in sort of more of an in incremental, time, yeah. in incremental fashion rather than somebody just like does something nuts. If That's usually created by somebody just having 10 mana super early. It's usually not created if everyone's got four mana, then five mana, then six mana, yeah. right? It's the classic Cassius turn three Ugin kind of thing. In this case, everyone, you know, had to wait for their mana to come around. Brandon was waiting on that last swamp for the entire game, but it made things so much more intense as a result. And of course, everyone was doing the Progenitus countdown as well for, for, uh, for Nissa cosplay. Yeah, well, some people argue that green loses its color identity when you mm -hmm. include every signet, every piece of fast artifact mana. Mm -hmm. And so maybe this is a way that, I mean, we're not playing Elvish Mystics, because that's probably in his powered cube. Right. But this might be a way that green big mana strategies are able to kind of exist in the way that they're supposed to be. Yeah, and I, I had like a Rishkar that did, you know, one ramp was just pretty good in that game because it was just one more than everybody else had. Yeah. You know, and then I had the Utopia Sprawl that just one piece of fixing because nobody else really had fixing. Yeah. Just makes a big difference when there's not much of it. When everybody's got tons of it, then any single piece is not worth that much. So it really changed the value of Rishkar to like something you really wanted just because, well, 
there's not a lot of ramp. So this one does ramp and I, yeah. I'm going to be one man ahead of everybody. That's a big mm-hmm. thing. Yeah. yeah. Pretty cool how that changed the game dynamic and, and, and how the game played out. You know, Brandon also includes some cards in there that are not legal in Commander, right? Oh, right. We're already making non-legendary creatures legendary. We're adding extra text to things. And Brandon, you know, I think as, again, he's a story writer. He's a world builder. He definitely felt like he wanted to be a little more creative with his cube. And this is 100% something you can do as well with your own experience. Uh, he had some uncards in there. Yeah. One of them, uh, the, the clay, clay pigeon, pigeon. Uh, used a great effect <laughs> in the great. game. <laughs> Somehow gets around Progenitus, by the way, because it's any Who source. Who knew? <laughs> Thank you for the templating on that one, Maro. <laughs> so yeah, just because it's a commander cube doesn't mean you need to follow the official rules. Yeah. And in my vintage cube, I have a few uncards as well, and they add a little bit of spice and flavor to it. And so feel free to build whatever kind of decks that work with you. And some of those uncards... I mean, we were kind of wondering, could they be our commanders? Uh-huh. Like, how cool are they? Well, maybe they belong in a commander cube. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. Actually, a lot of people wish they could play them and have wanted to build decks around them or whatever. And this is a place where, like, you get to say all the rules of the thing. So you're like, you're playing my cube, and X is legal in this cube, and yeah. so is... You know, Baron the, von Count. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All that stuff. And this is a place where, uh, yeah, we can get to see those commanders do some work. And they're just the same as any legendary creature in my cube. So I, I really like that, that yeah. it opens up those kind of possibilities. Another thing that Brandon did in his cube, and you can do in all your cubes, especially Commander Cube, is you can just have different rules than Commander. Just because it's called Commander Cube doesn't mean you have to follow all of the official rules of Commander. So, yeah. For instance, no. Nadine, Nadine wasn't Singleton. She had two Azorius Chanceries in there because right. she could draft two of them. Uh, no commander damage. Brandon just decided that that wasn't really necessary in the cube, so the commander damage is not there. Um, there were actually a couple cards, a couple of his regalia that like said, this creature has commander damage. Just, uh, to, yeah, that's interesting. Cool. just to make it interesting. That. Um, all the planeswalkers in the cube could be your commander. He just mm. said that at the start. Clover's commanders, planeswalkers are commanders, and uh, it sounds like he really played around with that so that you didn't really have to worry about getting a legendary creature because there's so many commanders in your draft environment. Yeah, you just have a lot of choice is you're not going to have to mm-hmm. worry about, oh, man, I hope one more comes around. There's yeah, because it's a planeswalker, yeah. a Nephilim, all sorts yeah, of good stuff. Yeah. Uh, he also specified that in the cube, hybrid mana cards, if they were in your deck, they counted as either or. So it, you could have a hybrid Orzhov card even if you didn't have white in your color identity for your commander. It could be in your 99. But if it was in your command zone, a hybrid mana card, then it counted as and. So that's to be both, yeah. Or, yeah, yeah. Because otherwise cards like Alesha and things just wouldn't work, right? Mm-hmm. Because, yep. <laughs> yeah. So pretty interesting how Brandon got around a lot of the little problems and issues we were talking about and really made something that, I got to say, like the game played out awesome and the decks all felt super fun. Like nobody just built like a regular straightforward deck. Everyone had a plan, had a strategy and was able to sort of like put their personality into it. It was cool because it felt like a mix between an unset and a regular draft because all of a sudden in conspiracy, right? Because you're doing special things, you're taking special cards. I had one that let me look through the rest of his cube and pick out a couple of cards after and that gave me so much more security so I could do this strategy a little more instead or focus some picks here. So I definitely encourage all the people that have that creative sort of spark in them or just want to experiment around. Nothing's ever final. Right, I'm sure Brandon went home and made some changes to his cube even after we played with it that day. Uh, you can really do a lot of different stuff with your cubes, and you can make it really any experience you want. And for instance, I think it was a 40 card minimum for our decks, but everyone ended up putting 50, 55, 60 cards in their deck. And if they would have put less, I would have been way better off in that game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, like you mentioned, <laughs> I, I really like the passion and the creativity that's involved in here. Uh, I wasn't on that episode of Game Nights, but I'm a huge fan of Brandon Sanderson. So I was like, can I, can I come over? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, DJ visited I just that like day showed to get a book up. signed. Yeah, I just, just showed up signed, yeah. like, you signed my book? Um, but I, we <laughs> also sat down and talked, but we talked about yeah. Cube for a while and it's sort of the passion that's involved in it and really the creativity and the problem solving of, of well, this is exciting and this and this and this and this and this. And, this. Yeah. and really it's the community. You talk about it with other people. You figure out, well, what's good and what doesn't work and you talk about it with your friends. A lot of times when a draft is done, you're done. Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? But one of the great things about sort of building a cube and inviting your friends in along with it is the, well, what was good? What was bad? Oh, oh my gosh. What do I think about this card? Every time a new set comes out, like I get text messages that are saying like, so-and-so good for vintage cube. You know, <laughs> once upon a time, questing beast in your cube. And I'm like, oh, Veil of 100%. Summer in your cube? Oko 100% in there. Right? Yeah. Oko. Oko's in. Veil of Summer, no. Ah. Uh... 
there's okay. there's hate cards are a whole different thing that a lot of cube people talk about. Yeah, it's like, do you play like Red Elemental Blast in your right. cube? Like, right. Do right. you play Protection from like or True Name Nemesis things like that? And yeah. so actually, there's a lot of different cube people that have so many opinions, and that's the fun part is that you'll kind of be a part of a bigger community. Yeah, there is definitely a cube community out there. A lot of resources for you if you're interested in building one. Again, we'll have in the show notes for this episode the link to Brandon's full list of his cube, all his like rules and stuff, the regalia, uh, if you want to, the custom ones, if you want to make your own, also the ones that Brandon does have yep. in his cube. We'll put a link to the Card Kingdom starter cube. And then if you just Google how to build a cube and stuff. Oh. There's going to be a ton of yeah. information out there. So, information. Yeah. And if you get a chance, go and play a cube and get an experience of what it's like and that'll give you a better idea of like, oh, okay. Or if you want you know, draft more in general, you're going to find out what you like and don't like as well when it comes to it. One last thing about cubes, and DJ, I'm sure you can attest to this. If you are building the cube and it's your cube and you're lending it out to other people to play, make sure that you know where all the cards go and they all get back to you at the end of the night. Count them all out because so many times cards get lost, they may get misplaced, dropped on the ground, or in worst case scenario, someone might take something. So just be wary of that. I know for a fact that Cube is one of those really fun experiences. I don't want to get spoiled by you know losing one of your favorite cards because you did it in a public area and then someone put their sideboard over here and forgot to pick it up, yada, yada. If it's a draft, it's a little different, but with Cube, it's your collection. Good advice. All, all right. right, to the listeners... Have you ever built a commander cube? Was it designed with any of these special mechanics or things similar to Brandon's regalia or any of these other little tricks we talked about, extra cards in the pack, or maybe like trading at the end or having a, a whole bunch of legendary creatures that after the draft is over that you could choose from if you have to. Yeah, yeah. what's your secret tech that's yeah. really worked that other people can pick up on? Yeah, because there's a lot of people after the Game Nights episode that are like, I really want to build a Commander Cube. That looked like a lot of fun. And any resources or help that you can give them in the comment section and whatnot is, is really great for the entire community. I have one really great resource that everyone should use. It's cardkingdom.com slash command zone. That's our affiliate <laughs> link. If you're going to buy cards, if you're going to buy a bunch of them in bulk, I you know I really do enjoy buying cards from one place if I'm buying a lot of them because you make sure that they all get to you. They're all going to be graded by the same person, shipped in the right same quality, and it gets to you on time so you don't need to wait around for 50 different pieces to come in to make a cube. So if you use that affiliate link, you're really supporting the show. You're supporting everything that we do here at Game Nights. And you know I can't wait to see what people build. Cardkingdom.com slash Command zone. Really do check out that starter cube. The thing is, legit. yeah, that's that's such a great idea. Yeah, they got uh, Chris Van Meter and some other people over there who oh, yeah, are like CVM. high level Magic players that are building this stuff, so they know what they're doing. Uh, and then once you have the cube then you're going to want to protect that thing. Again, Ultra Pro is our other sponsor, and they do everything. They give you all the tools you need to protect all of your stuff. They have a, a number of different things that will hold a cube. Mm -hmm. They've got a specific box. It's right over here that's a cube holder. They've got awesome sleeves so you can protect your cards and all the, all the other stuff, you know, relic tokens and things like that. A lot of cubes have a separate box that's all the lands and then another box that's all yeah. the tokens and stuff like that. They, you really get into, like, spicing up your cube in the same way that you would your deck, and Ultra Pro helps you do all that. It's important to to make sure all the cards are sleeved in the same durability sleeves. Same exact sleeve. Same exact sleeve. So yeah, mm -hmm. buying, for instance, my uh, our friend Josh Kim just sleeved this entire thing up in Eclipse sleeves, and it's a dream to shuffle that thing together. You're taking huge piles, shuffling it, and everyone, it's great. This is actually a bigger deal than you might think, because I've sleeved in poor sleeves before, and as soon as one sleeve breaks, you need to replace it with another one, oh, but you need the consistency yeah. of being able to say, well, this new sleeve will match all my other ones, so you don't have to resleeve huge groups of it, so right. you re maintain the consistency. So it's actually a really big deal to get high quality sleeves that all last a same, long time, yeah. all from the same that don't have weird variations between them. So yeah. Eclipse sleeves are the way to go. Or just do it all unsleeved and go nuts. Actually, do not recommend that. Don't, yeah, don't do don't that. Don't do that. See, even Josh doesn't recommend that. <laughs> All right, so now it's time for the end step where we talk about something cool outside the world of magic. DJ, you got something cool? I do. Oh, he came prepared. Oh, I did. Goodness, we were. Uh, I was about to whip out my. I was like phone. looking what at my I phone, I like, oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, something cool outside the ah, world yes. of magic is the show Living with Yourself on Netflix. Oh, I've seen the trailer. I haven't watched it. This is uh, yeah. Paul Rudd. Paul it's Rudd. Paul Rudd, and it's creepy and funny and really makes you think it's of i don't want to spoil it because well, give us there's the, so the much pitch, stuff though. what's it about like in two sentences 
what would you say it's about? Like, it's Paul Rudd. He comes home one day from the trailer, and he's literally okay, face-to-face yeah, okay, with himself, right? Trailer. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, I saw the trailer. Well, I know. So, so, the first, so I've, I've only seen, seen the first couple episodes, like, and I wanted to I can to pitch sure any that. movie, by the way. Yeah. I don't have to have seen it. <laughs> <laughs> years and years. I'm already pitching it. I'm just like, yeah. I saw the trailer. One lonely man. It. Yeah. Paul Rudd is sort of in a rut in his life. He kind of sucks at work. Oh, my gosh. Damn it. <laughs> you okay. said it. <laughs> He's in a deep rud. He can't get out of this, this rud that he's in. Uh, he's having problems with his wife and his job. And so he decides to sort of freshen up a little bit um, when that goes horribly awry and he ends up with a, a clone of himself ah. that's now been thrown into his life. And now he's his roommate. Right. And now he has to figure out exactly how to deal with this version of himself that also has a place in his life. Interesting. Very cool. It's going and it through means- the same thing that The Rock went through. Ryan Seacrest went through <laughs> it. How are there? Yeah, seriously, how, are how is The Rock doing? in every single TV show? It's not possible in movies. Because yeah. he has his family, just five rocks. He has four clones. Four probably. clones, yeah. <laughs> he probably all- wrote this thing, too. <laughs> yeah. One of his clones wrote it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that means Paul Rudd playing two different characters, always a fun showcase for actors to do. I know that for sure. And so I'm sure it's a lot of fun because I do love Paul Rudd a lot. He's a great actor and it's dark and funny and really makes you think along the way. It's great. Cool. Cool. I'll check it out. Living with yourself. What's something else that makes you think? Something else that makes you think is our sister podcast, The Masters of Modern. Yeah, Alex Kessler and Ben Bateman, they talk about the modern format and all things competitive magic. You can find them on Twitter at the MMCast. You can find them right next to us at Collected.Company. Or you can just type The Masters of Modern into your podcast app or YouTube. They're doing videos now. Find them. All right. Our editing, graphics, and logistics team here at the Command Zone House is Craig Blanchett, Ashlyn Rose, Alfred Estaca, Terry Robertson, Josh Murphy, Jake Boss, and Sam Waldo, and occasionally... DJ. Thank you. And special thanks to Jeffrey Palmer for the Living Card Animations at Living Cards MTG. What do we got today? Days. Oh, days. days. The invocation. Invocation days. And you can also find his animations at start and end our show at youtube.com slash the command zone podcast. DJ, where can they find you? You can find me on YouTube, Jumbo Commander. That's my YouTube channel. Uh, Follow me on Twitter at Jumbo Commander. Check it out. Make sure you do. Also, I love your logo. Every time I see that elephant, it makes me very happy. Thank you. (laughs) <laughs> Everybody loves DJ. Yeah, who doesn't? All right, everyone, thanks so much for listening. Bye, everyone. Peace. Bye bye. Thank you for your attention. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com. Or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs> <laughs>